Speaking of great things happening, we have a guest speaker, and he's just, he's a true gift to me, to our congregation. There are some times where people put a person in your life, and you think, I'm a better person because of this person that's in my, influence in my life, and this is one of those. He is, uh, so we're part of a denomination. He is our denominational leader in this, on the West Coast, it's, it's, the title is uh, Regional Executive Director, so he oversees our church. He prays for you regularly. He loves you. You're constantly on his mind. Uh, and so we're just grateful for him. He's uh, my friend. His name is Chris Hansler. We welcome Pastor Chris to our stage. Just a joy to have him. Thank you, Pastor Isaac. Appreciate it. Good morning. It is so good to be here. And uh, I'm so grateful for you, for this church, for your impact into this community. And uh, I'm grateful for your leaders. You have a great team. You know that, right? You have a great leadership team. I'm so grateful for you, Pastor Isaac and Katie. Continuing to pray for Katie as she deals with foot stuff that's going on with her. And, um, and I, of course, love our um, Pastor Gary and Arlene. And uh, Pastor Gary is our district director in this district for Open Bible. And so he also serves on my board. And uh, I just, I've met some of your team, uh, Ben and and a Kim, and uh, you know, you just, you just have a great, you know that, right? You have a great team. Thank God for the team that you have here at Turning Point, and I'm Turning Point, here at the intersection. I heard, I heard uh, Isaac talking about something that's happening at Turning Point too, right? That's another one of our churches uh, over here in Spokane, and so um, grateful to be here, uh, and I love this time of year. What a beautiful, I drove over, I, I live over on the west side, in a town called Bonnie Lake, and I uh, drove over here yesterday, and it's just so beautiful. I love this time of year. Springtime, it's getting warmer, days are getting warmer, um, the things are starting to bud, and things are starting to bloom out. It's Masters weekend, Did any golfers in the room here? Master, just you, Gary, just you and I. Um, and, uh, and baseball has started, which is my absolute favorite sport. Uh, it's just a great time of year, and um, you know I'm, I'm kind of a sports fan. I love to watch sports. I so I, I I even watch golf on television. I know some people don't understand that, but but I, I'm kind of a sports fan, and and I love to watch sports. My kids are not huge sports fans. My daughter is an avid baseball fan. Seattle Mariners, go Mariners! They're off to a rough start, but but um, but my daughter's an avid baseball fan. But but. I'm also a football fan. I, I, love, I love football. And um, I, by the way, I was rooting for the Zags in March Madness, and I was sad to see them not go further than they did. But anyway, uh, I'm a football fan. I love, to, I love the Seahawks. I'm a Seahawks fan. And so my kids not really um, sports fans, except my daughter this year became a football fan. My daughter, my youngest, is my youngest, and she's 32. I have two boys and a girl. She became a football fan this year, and she became a fan this year of the Kansas City Chiefs. So, so you might, some, some of you might know what the connection is to my daughter and the Kansas City Chiefs, but there, there's, a, there's a little thing that happened, a little dynamic that happened in our culture over the course of this last year, and that is there's a, there's a young lady who, who's relatively well-known uh, in our country and in the world in the music industry named Taylor Swift. Anybody ever heard of Taylor Swift? Swifties in the room here? Okay. Not a lot of Swifties here. But, um, but my daughter is a bit of a Swifty, and so she's a Taylor Swift, you know, she knows her, and this, this Taylor Swift, brilliant musician, probably maybe more brilliant marketer, um, but, but she became the girlfriend to a football player for the Kansas City Chiefs named Travis Kelsey. So they had a little love story going there, still have a little love story going. And so because of that connection, my daughter started getting interested in the podcast between Travis Kelsey and his brother Jason Kelsey. That connected them to football, her to football. She started following the Kansas City Chiefs. She started learning about football, which was a delight for me. So in the Super Bowl, because the Kansas City Chiefs were playing the San Francisco 49ers, I'm always rooting for anybody who's playing against the San Francisco 49ers. So I got, to, I got to be on the same team with my daughter cheering for the Kansas City Chiefs. And the whole reason my daughter was a Kansas City Chiefs fan is the influence of a celebrity, Taylor Swift. 
Interestingly, on the other side, on the, on the San Francisco 49er side, they have a player that was deemed Mr. Irrelevant. He's deemed Mr. Irrelevant because he was the last pick on the last day of the NFL draft when he was chosen. And, and the person who's usually picked last on the last day of the NFL draft usually doesn't make it very far in the NFL. But he wound up rising to the very top of his trade, became the uh, starting quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers in the Super Bowl. A good guy. As much as I don't like the 49ers, I do like that young man, Brock Purdy. Um, but both of those, these, these two rose to the top of their game, Taylor Swift and Brock Purdy. And, and they, they have influence. And like it or not, celebrities in our culture, they shape the cultural narr- much of the cultural narrative in our society. Whether we like them or whether we don't like them, whether we agree with them or whether we don't agree with them, whether we like it or not, they shape much of the cultural narrative that is happening in our society and, and they shape the things like what people wear and what people listen to and all these kinds of things. And, and one of the things that is true about our society is we live in a celebrity culture. And, and, and to some degree, that has come into the church a little bit. And it concerns me a little bit when that comes into the church. You know, now there are kind of celebrity pastors, and there's celebrity worship leaders, and there's celebrity worship teams. I mean, it's, it's interesting, and we sort of elevate. And whenever we elevate some people above other people, we can miss out on the reality that God can use ordinary people in ordinary places. And empower them to do extraordinary things. You don't have to be a celebrity. You don't have to be something special. You don't have to be the very best of the very best to have influence. That you can have influence no matter who you are, no matter where you are. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have a calling on your life. And you can have great influence. And I would tell you, you can even have greater influence far more eternal influence than any celebrity that's shaping our cultural narrative. Because you can have an eternal influence. We're going to be in the book of Acts, but I'm going to start in the book of Mark, chapter 3 and verse 13. And I want to read this passage of Scripture, and I'm going to ask you to do something with me. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you will. Um, If you'd stand, uh, we have this passage, Mark 3, verses 13 to 15. Uh, It's going to be up here on the screen. And I'm going to just invite you, uh, as I read it, to read it out loud with me. Okay? So we're going to read this passage together, and um, and, uh, I want to hear it. Now, sometimes when we read out loud, we, we can sort of read it without emotion. As you read it, I want you to read it with some enthusiasm, with some energy. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Mark chapter 3. Here we go. Jesus went up on a mountainside... And called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Now, I want you to notice something in this passage. It says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. Now what has happened here is Jesus has burst on the scene. He's teaching these revolutionary teachings. People are being healed. People are starting to follow him by the masses. He's got followers. He goes up on a mountainside and he's going to pray. But he's, he's going up there and he's going to call his disciples, the 12 that are going to start following him. And it says that he called those he wanted. I always think, what about the other people who are in that group? We're thinking, hey, how come I'm not a part of that? I want, I want to be among those. But Jesus knew that these were the twelve that the Father had called him to to call alongside of him, that he would impart the ministry to them, and they would carry it after Jesus was gone. So he called to them those he wanted. And why did he call them? And they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might, what? Be with him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him. That they might be with him. That's important. Remember that. Let's pray, and then then I'll have you be seated. Father... Thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for that worship time where we got to focus our hearts and our minds on who you are. And Lord, we ask that today that we would hear from you. We would hear your voice. You would open up our heart. 
that open up our mind, that we would have ears to hear what you want to say to us as individuals and us as the, as the church. Lord, we know we live in a very broken world. And Lord, there are tensions and there are battles happening around the world. There's the battle that we know is happening right now in the Middle East. And God, we just ask for your mercy. We ask for your intervention. We ask for your justice. We ask for your peace. But Lord, help us to be ambassadors of this message that you've entrusted to us of the good news of Jesus. So Lord, I ask that you'd set me aside that our eyes would be fixed and focused on Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to be in Acts 3, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a story in Acts 3. A little background of Acts 3. What has happened is now, in, when, by the time we get to Acts chapter 3, Jesus has now uh, been crucified, and he has risen again, which we just celebrated a couple years ago, the greatest day in human history. The day on which human, the hinge of human history shifts is Resurrection Sunday. And uh, so Jesus is risen. He's commissioned his disciples to go and share this, this good news uh, to, to all those that, that they could reach. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you'll be my witnesses. That's what, he told, that's what he told his disciples. And then Jesus ascends into heaven and then they're gathered and they're waiting for this promised Holy Spirit that Jesus said he would send, that, that he had been with them, but the Holy Spirit would now be in them, would be, would be continually in them, would fill them. So they're waiting for the promised spirit. The spirit of God comes and he falls on, his, on Jesus' followers and it's a miraculous move of the spirit. They're able to communicate in languages they hadn't known and they're able to hear the message of the gospel in ways that they'd never heard before. Thousands of people are coming to Christ, yielding their lives to him. They're seeing people, all these people baptized. Uh, and there's this great sense of community. They're in it together. They're sharing with one another. They're loving one another. They're listening to the apostles' teachings, breaking bread, praying together. It's just this beautiful picture of what's happening as the Spirit of God has come on all of His, believe, on all of his followers. And now we pick it up in Acts chapter 3. And uh, it says this. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, I'm just going to walk you through this story, sort of verse by verse, but I want you to just notice it says one day. Now, this wasn't a special day. This wasn't a holiday. This wasn't a special religious festival or a religious day. It was just one day, just a day like any other day, sort of like today is. Today is special because we're all here together in God's house, but it was just one day. One day, and they were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. It's just what they did. It's part of the, their Jewish custom, their, their, their normal religious practices. They would go to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Peter and John had probably done this hundreds of times before. And um, they were doing it on this one particular day. Now it says, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. This, this person was there every day. Somebody would bring him there. He, he was lame from birth. He would sit outside of the temple and he would beg. And it was normal for people in that day to give alms to the poor. And so he would beg for alms from the poor. And, and so he was there every day. It's just this temple gate called Beautiful. Now, um, history tells us, that there maybe wasn't an, an official gate called beautiful, but what we know is this particular gate was a little more ornate. So it's, it's as though they were saying, no, I'm not going to go to that gate. I'm going to go to the beautiful gate. So they called that gate beautiful because it was just beautifully ornate there. So here's this guy who's outside that gate every day um, as people were coming into the temple courts. It goes on and it says, now he saw Peter and John about to enter and he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. Now the guy who's out there and he's begging them for, for money um, catches the attention of Peter and John on this one particular day. And Peter says, look at us. Now I don't know what the tone of his saying look at us was. I don't know if it was, look at us, do we look like we have any money? Or if it was, hey, I want, you to, ha I want to get your attention, so look at us. I think that's more probably what it was. Look at us. 
He gets their attention. So verse 5 says, So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Peter says, I, I, don't, have, I don't have money. I don't have silver. I don't have gold. But what I do have I can give you. And what I have is Jesus. I can give you Jesus. Now this guy wasn't asking for that. He was asking for something different. But what Peter and John could give him was the power of Jesus. Now, why on this particular day? I, I would speculate, and it is speculation, but I think it is legitimate speculation, but I would speculate that Peter and John had probably been by this guy many times before because they went regularly to the temple at the hour of prayer. And it says that this guy was there every day. So they probably walked by this guy maybe dozens of times before. I would even speculate, and I don't believe it's too much of a reach, to speculate that maybe Jesus himself walked by this guy. Because Jesus also practiced some of those same Jewish customs, went into the temple at the hour of prayer. And I imagine Jesus also walked by this guy. So why on this particular day does Peter and John catch this person's attention, stop, and say, listen, I don't have silver and gold, but what I have I can give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Why on this particular day? And this is a gutsy move. <laughs> this, this thing that they're saying is a gutsy move, and it's full of faith. And I, and I think, what if it didn't work? What if they're like, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. This guy has never, he's been lame from birth. But, but it does work. They knew that for whatever reason, this ordinary day was different than any other ordinary day. That something about the Holy Spirit working inside of them stopped them on this particular day. And it was going to make an ordinary day an extraordinary day for this person. And the miracle, so, so it goes on, the scripture goes on and it says this. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, he began to walk, then he went with them into the temple, walking and jumping and praising God. I mean, what a story this is. This is an incredible story. It's not only the miracle that this person's legs were healed and, and his legs were made whole, but this man had been lame from birth. He had never walked. So not only did, was his, were his legs healed, but he could immediately and instantly not only walk, but he could walk, he could jump, he could leap, and he goes running into the temple courts and praising God. Now remember what's happening at the temple courts at this particular hour. It's the hour of prayer. It's a probably ser pretty serious thing going on inside that temple, right? They're having, they're having a prayer meeting, and in comes this guy from outside the temple that they'd seen every day out there. He comes walking, and he's jumping, and he's shouting, and I imagine the religious leaders are like, hey, we got a prayer meeting going on in here. He's kind of disruptive, but this guy had just been set free by the power of God on an ordinary day. You see, our one day might be somebody else's miracle day. Our ordinary day might just be the day the Holy Spirit stops you and says, we want this to be this person's extraordinary day. That's why we need to pay attention to the Holy Spirit and His promptings in our life. This guy had day after day after day sat outside the temple. And interestingly, outside the temple at the gate, beautiful. But I imagine there was much emotion that had gone on in the mind of this man who sat outside the temple begging for alms every day. Sometimes maybe getting generosity, sometimes may, maybe not getting as much generosity as he wished he would. He probably wished he could get up and walk into that temple with others many days. Sometimes he was probably sad, sometimes days he was probably frustrated. Some days as he walked, watched them go in the temple and out of the temple, in the temple and out of the temple every day, he was probably sometimes even angry. Like, why am I in this situation? And sometimes, because of circumstances, whether it's circumstances we brought on ourselves because of dumb decisions we've made, or whether it's circumstances that are beyond our control, 
we can get pretty frustrated and we can feel pretty isolated and we can feel pretty excluded. Like, why does everybody else get this to happen in their life and why am I in this circumstance that I'm in? And I imagine that's a little how this man must have felt at times. But on this particular day, this man was set free. And his day became an extraordinary day. It goes on in verse 9 and it says, When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Of course they were because it was wonderful and it was amazing. The story goes on and it, and it, and it talks about how now all, when this happened, all the people started going to Peter and John. And they started thinking there was something special about Peter and John. Oh, Peter and John must be the celebrities. It's them are the ones who, who really are, 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 are special. They're really making something happen. And what Peter says to them is he says, listen, don't look at us. It's not us. There, there's nothing special we did. Peter says, this is the power of Jesus. This is the one who you killed, but who rose again, who has done this in this man's life. Verse 16 of chapter 3 says, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you all can see. Peter and John say, don't look at us. We're just ordinary guys. It's Jesus who did this work. So after this happens, the religious leaders are now mad because not, not only um, did Peter and John say, you know, th- this is the Jesus who you killed um, is, is, is the one who's caused this to happen. So they're, they're feeling a little put on the spot here. But they also, Peter and John were also preaching about the resurrection. And some of the religious leaders of that particular day didn't believe in the resurrection and so they thought this was false teaching. And so the religious leaders mad at them, uh, threw them in jail. The problem was that after Peter and John did this, and after they preached the gospel to these people, another 5,000 people came to Christ. And so they had all of these people who were becoming followers of Christ because of the ministry of Peter and John, and then you had the religious leaders who had thrown them in jail. So they had this tension going on between the religious leaders and now not only Peter and John, but the people who were following the word and the message that they were bringing. So we pick it up in Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 8, and reading through verse 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to notice this, that Peter, remember Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. The Holy Spirit came on them, and then it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame, are being asked how he, now let me pause here. They, notice they don't say, if we are being called to account for this miracle that we performed, if we are being called to, to account because of how, how special we are, he doesn't say that. He says, if we're being called to account for an act of kindness, It was a simple noticing of a person who is in need and the Spirit stopped him and said, I want you to pay attention to this person right now because I want to do something for them. It was an act of kindness. It says, uh, and are being asked how he was healed, it goes on, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Verse 11 says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone. Now remember, this happened at the temple. The temple was the place where they went to worship. It was a place that represented the presence of God. And so he's referencing back to the temple and he says, Jesus is the stone you, you builders rejected who has become the cornerstone. He says, he says, Jesus is the very cornerstone of the temple where you worship. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. What they're saying, what Peter Peter is saying here is, listen, it's not only this man who was healed and who was saved, but all of us need a Savior. He's saying to them, all of you need a Savior. Jesus doesn't just heal, but, but it's by the name of Jesus 
that we can be saved and all of us need a Savior. Now the remarkable verse, this next verse is, is, is simply remarkable. It says this, When they saw the courage of Peter and John <laughs> and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had what? That they had been with Jesus. Ordinary, unschooled men, they were astonished, they took note that they had been with Jesus. They could tell Peter and John had been with Jesus. The New Living Translation, I like the way it says it. It says it this way, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that, listen to this, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. These are just guys. These are just normal, ordinary people. They didn't have special training. What they had done is they had spent three years walking with Jesus. They'd been with him. And the fact they'd been with him and then Jesus gave them the power of the Holy Spirit to be in them, that is what made all of the difference. But they're regular guys, unschooled, untrained, not flashy, not celebrities. Do you know that history tells us, if you look at his, many, I would say probably most historians, when you think about how old were the disciples when Jesus called them to follow him, do you know that most or at least many, but I would say most historians believe that the disciples were, 11 of the 12 disciples were teenagers when he called them to follow him. Now when we see depictions of the disciples, right, on paintings or on television programs or in movies, they always look like they're 30 or 40 years old, beards, you know, a little bit weathered. <laughs> teenagers. 11 of the 12, the, the, the one they think that maybe wasn't a teenager was Peter, who was married. So by the time they walk with Jesus for three years, Jesus is now resurrected. Now these guys are at best in their early 20s. Young men. We need to normalize that again. Right? These were normal, unschooled, untrained, not flashy, probably very young, inexperienced but zealous, but the, what made the difference in these people, these disciples? They had been with Jesus. God takes ordinary people in ordinary places. You might not feel qualified enough. You might not feel talented enough. You might feel like you don't have enough training. You might feel like you don't know enough. You haven't studied enough. Um, you, uh, you, maybe you have some stuff in your past and you think, oh man, I'm not, you know, I, I, that, has, that has disqualified me, I'm not good enough, or I'm not a pastor, I don't even know what my gifts are. You might think, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I, I, listen, God uses ordinary people. I do all kinds of dumb things. Somehow God has chosen in His grace and in His mercy to use me. And he wants to do the same in every one of your lives. Can you love people? Can you notice people? Can you have compassion on people? Can you show an act of kindness? Can you listen? Can you care for people? See, thankfully, it isn't completely dependent on us and our skill and our ability and our wisdom and our training and our background. It is us plus the power of Jesus. God uses ordinary people in ordinary places. This miracle that we just read about, where did it happen? It didn't happen inside the temple. It didn't happen inside where they were doing the prayer meeting. They weren't having a healing service. <laughs> This was outside the temple. It's like, as, as it's like if you came here for church this morning, it's like this was happening out in the parking lot. It wasn't even because of my great preaching <laughs> or, or, or Pastor Isaac's great preaching. This is just happening somewhere outside the temple where this guy was just out there and they just noticed him out there. That's where 
This lame man begging for money encountered Jesus, and he encountered Jesus in the form of Peter and John. Notice that he had been, they had been with Jesus. See, I think sometimes we act as in the church. So we need to be kind of, we need to have special ability to really be a minister of the gospel. But I want to tell you, every one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, is called. Is called as a minister, as an ambassador of the gospel. Every single one of us. He's given you that ability and that calling. But sometimes we, we think, oh, we need some sort of special training, and we al- almost act as though the veil is still up. And let me explain what I mean by that. When Jesus went to the cross, and when he died, well, let me back it up a little bit more. In the temple where they would worship, there was the outer courts, and then there were the inner courts, and then once you went further into the temple, you came to this place called the Holy of Holies. And between the inner court and the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that's where it represented the very presence of Jesus. And only one person could go into the Holy of Holies, and that was the priest who would intercede for the sins of the people. He had to go through this thick veil because only the priest could be in the, in the, in the presence of God in that way. But when Jesus died on the cross, the scripture tells us that the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. And what that means is that no longer was access to the presence of the Father reserved just for a priest or just for a special person. But now, every single one of us who are followers of Christ have immediate access to God the Father. That we can go right to Him. Uh, because that veil has now been torn. But sometimes, in the way we act, in the way we um, sort of express our faith, we act as though the veil is still up. And here's what I mean by that. We kind of act like when we, when we walk into, or when we drive into the parking lot of the church, right? We're still, still pretty safe. In fact, I've known people who have driven into church parking lots and they can't get out of their car and come in because they don't feel qualified enough to come into the church building. They don't feel worthy enough to come into the church building. And it's almost like sometimes we view the church building, like the lobby out there, which was, you are fantastically friendly, by the way. I, I love how kind and friendly this congregation is. And I love that there's people who've been here for 50 years, and there are people who've just been here for a few months. This, that's such a sign of health. I just love it. But anyway... I got distracted there for a second. So, so sometimes you, you come in, the, the lobby out there is sort of like the outer courts, right? And then you come into this part, this is like the inner courts. But in order to come up on the stage, this is like the holy of holies. Like you can't go from there to here unless you're something special, unless you're a minister. And in that way, sometimes we, we act as though the veil is still up. The veil has been torn. You don't have to be something special Uh, to to, to find value and ministry as a follower of Christ. Is it good to have training to preach? Of course. Is it good to have competency to sing? Of course. But listen, you don't have to be any more spiritual to be here than you do have to be there. We're all called. We're all His children. And sometimes we act as though the veil is still up. But it's, it's been torn down. Listen, you are the temple where Jesus abides. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the place where God's presence reigns. And so God takes ordinary people uh, in ordinary places and empowers them to do extraordinary things. What was different about Peter and John? What was different about Peter and John is they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. And they had the power of God's Spirit living within them. Some of you might have wondered why I have this hula hoop. The reason is I'm going to have Pastor Gary come and show us, demonstrate how to hula hoop this morning. (laughs) And I hate to disappoint you, but I also am not going to show you how to hula hoop this morning. You do not want to see that. Um, This... Picture this as representing the kingdom of God. When you, when you yield your life to Christ, when you become a follower of Jesus and you say yes to Him and you're now filled with His Holy Spirit, you carry with you, all of us as followers of Christ carry with us, we bring with us the kingdom of God everywhere we go. 
And we bring his kingdom presence as ambassadors of the kingdom into every place that we frequent, into every area where, where we enter. So when you, walk into the, when you walk into the store this afternoon to get some groceries, you're carrying with you the presence of Jesus. You're carrying into, in with you the kingdom principles. When you go home, you bring the kingdom of God with you wherever you go because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God the presence of Jesus, the power of His Holy Spirit is in you and you bring His kingdom ways. You take, we take our cues from the kingdom, not from the world, right? So we bring His kingdom ways. Everywhere. When students, when they go to school, they bring in the kingdom of God with them into that school. When you go into a restaurant, uh, you bring the kingdom of God. What is, in that, what, what is within the realm of the kingdom of God? Things like love and joy and and goodness, and kindness, and a non-anxious presence, that when you enter into that place, there is something different that happens because you come into that place. Why? Not because you're special, because, but because you have been with Jesus. And the more of us who are bringing that representation of the kingdom of God, the power of his presence into those places, the more we can be the ones who shape the narrative of the culture. Not because we're a celebrity, but because Jesus is working in and through our lives. What doesn't belong in this, in, this, in this circle of our lives? Things like greed, things like pride, things like racism, things like immorality, things like unholiness. What, all of those things that are outside of the kingdom, those things don't belong here. But we need to put on. We need to put on the new man. We need to put on Christ and we need to carry his kingdom presence everywhere we go. And in that, we can make an eternal difference everywhere we go. How can we be with Jesus? Let me just finish up with these quick, quick thoughts. How can we be with Jesus? First of all, follow him. This is what the disciples did. Jesus went to them and said, follow me. Follow me. And they followed him. There's a scripture in Luke chapter Uh, 9 verse 23 that says if anyone wishes to come after me let him deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me if you're going to be a follower of Jesus it's going to cost you the life as you've known it I can't stand up here and say it's going to be it's going to make everything easy it's going to make everything fixed. No, but it will, it will cost you the life as you've known it, but you will find the life that God has intended for you from the very beginning of creation. Follow Him. If you want to be with Jesus, you've got to follow Him. And you've got to yield everything to Him. That means, I'm, I'm going to, Lord, I'm going, to give you my, I'm going to give you my relationships. They're yours. I'm going to, I'm going to entrust those to you. God, I'm going to give you my decisions. Those decisions, those belong to you. God, I, I give you my entertainment choices. God, I give you my pain. Where's my wallet? God, that's his too. Our finances, we're, we're called to steward those. We follow him with everything we have and say, Jesus, what's my life now belongs to you. If you want to be with Jesus, you follow him. Secondly, how can you be with Jesus? Read the Bible. There is no shortcut to getting to know who Jesus is. This all points to him. Uh, and, and the scripture says in Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. If you want to know who Jesus is and if you want to be with Jesus, you've got to spend time in his word. And if you've never spent time in his word, I would encourage you, start in the gospels, Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, and get to know the Jesus of the gospels because this whole Bible points to Jesus. You want to be with Jesus? Spend time in his word. Third, be filled with the Spirit. As I said in Acts 1.8, it says, you'll receive power when my Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. When you yield your life to Christ, He fills you with His Spirit. But the Scripture tells us too that we need to keep being filled with the Spirit. We need to continually be filled, be being filled with the Spirit of God. And sometimes when we, when we sort of get distracted or, or maybe we're not, in, not following him like we normally should be. 
we can start to feel a little empty and we can start to feel a little dry. And I would encourage you this morning, be filled with the Spirit. And then this one day might become for you an extraordinary day because now you have the power of His presence to, to bring with you everywhere you go. Number four, practice the presence of Jesus. What does that mean? There's a scripture that says pray without ceasing. What it means is we need to remember that Jesus says, I will be with you always. He's always with us. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact that he's always with us. So I would just say, everywhere you go, when you're driving in your car, remember, Jesus is here. When you're walking into that Starbucks, remember, Jesus, you're with me. How would you want me to respond even in this setting. When you're going to work, he is with you. I love what Pastor Isaac did as he, caused, he, as he asked us to just pause and take a deep breath and remember the presence of Jesus. Because we get to remember Jesus is there with us and he wants to do something in your life and he wants to do something in the lives of those we encounter. Practice the presence of Jesus and he will give you an awareness on the ordinary days in ordinary places because he may just want on that particular day to do something extraordinary. And the last thing I would say is stay in community. Stay in community. Stay in the body of Christ. And I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here. But I want to encourage you, it's easy to just stop or it's easy to get sort of away from it. But we need the body of Christ. We want to be with Jesus. This is called his body. This is called the body of Christ. When, when, when we hear about small groups and being in community, be involved in community. Be with the people of God. That's how you're going to know what it means to, when, when people look at you, they'll, they'll be able to say, man, they've been with Jesus because you've been with the body of Christ. Stay in community. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I was on a, a couple months ago, I was on a flight home. I'd been at a conference in Austin, Texas. And um, it was a great conference with lots of information, packed full of information. And uh, I, was, I was really encouraged, but I was really tired. I'd been with people all those days, and I'd been learning all those days. And I, and I was getting, getting ready to fly from Austin back home to Seattle. And, um, and I, I was looking forward to that flight home. And I, because I fly a lot, I got bumped to a little better seat. So I was really excited about that. So I, I get on the airplane and I'm sitting in my seat and I'm thinking, I find I'm just going to relax. I'm just going to, you know, listen to music or a podcast or sleep or something. And so I sit down in my seat. The person who's going to be next to me wasn't there yet. And I think I'm going to put on my do not disturb sign, which is my headphones. And the Spirit of God stopped me and said, don't put those on yet. And I thought, oh, I just want to sleep, but Okay. So I, I, I paused a minute and a woman sat next to me, a little older than myself. And so we start having a little conversation before the plane um, takes off. And I, I think I asked her the question. I, I said, Nesso, are you, are you headed home? Or are you headed from home going somewhere? And she proceeded to talk to me about, you know, she was headed, she was headed home. And I found out in that midst of that conversation that, she had just lost her husband about three or four months prior. They'd been married many, many years. And she told me about how she was going. She lived in central Washington and she had this farm and orchards. She, she was going to figure out, she was trying to figure out how we can take care of that. And she was dealing with her grief. And, and I had lost my wife a couple of years ago. And so for the next four and a half hours, I had the absolute privilege of being able to share with that woman um, shared stories of the people that we'd lost. I got to share with that woman Jesus and the peace that he's brought into my life. And just toward the end of that flight, I got to pray with that woman and encourage her. And we both shed tears and we both encouraged one another. And on that particular day, that ordinary day where I was planning to just sleep, in that ordinary place, it became an opportunity because of the prompting of the Spirit of God to become an extraordinary moment, not only for hopefully for that woman to be encouraged, but also in my own life as an encouragement. Listen, if you listen to the voice of the Spirit, 
your ordinary day and somebody else's ordinary day can become an extraordinary day. It can become their miracle day. Have you been with Jesus? I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes, bow your heads, and just, I want to ask you a question. If, if, you, if you want God to empower you to do the extraordinary, if you want God to empower you to do the extraordinary, maybe you've been a little dry, maybe you haven't been in His Word, maybe you haven't been conscious and practicing the presence of Jesus, maybe you haven't been following Him, or maybe you have, but maybe you just need a fresh infilling of His Holy Spirit. And if you want the power of God to, to come on you so that you can turn somebody's day, maybe your own, into an extraordinary day, if you want God's power to do the extraordinary, would you just slip up your hand? I want to pray for you this morning as we, as we finish. If that's you. Amen. Amen. Keep your hand up for just a second. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to see it so I can pray for you. Father, I thank you for your power and your presence that works in us. And Lord, for those who have said, yes, I want to be a person who operates in the presence of Jesus, who is recognized as not as somebody special in and of themselves, but as a person who has been with Jesus. And because of that, you can take ordinary days and turn it into an extraordinary day just like that for somebody. Lord, I pray that we would be those who are sensitive to the voice of your Spirit and that we would stop where maybe we haven't stopped before. We would have compassion where maybe... We would just normally just walk right on by. That, Lord, you would interrupt our regular and, Lord, that you would turn it into something supernatural at your prompting. Lord, I pray that we would be those who are keen to the voice of your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, because of that, we, because we've been with Jesus, can be the ones who can shape the narrative of our culture moving forward. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Don't be seated yet. We're going to dismiss here in 37 seconds. Uh, but what a gift to be reminded, we walk with Jesus, we'll be able to make a difference and bring the kingdom of God with us everywhere we go. This world needs the kingdom of God. Uh, before you go, though, I want to remind you, sign up for community groups or small groups. Men, sign up for the men's event on April 27th. And today is the last day to sign up for our uh, Rooted Rhythms. This Saturday, it's going to be great. But I want to give you a prayer of blessing as we go. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and give you grace. We will keep his face shine upon you. Be go uh, I messed it. I messed it up. I messed it up. I always have, what you don't know is I have it written down and I look every week. I knew it. I knew I needed to pull it up. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can memorize it. How many times have I done this? The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Well, look face upon you and give you grace. I messed it up again, but the blessing still stands. <laughs> Intersection, you are loved. Go in peace.